Welcome to Tower Talk Business Radio, where we bring you conversations with the top business minds on Long Island and around the nation every week. Featuring expert consultants and small business owners who have found success, but are also willing to share their top tips, failures, and give gritty, matter-of-fact advice based on their firsthand experience. Now, let's Let's get get down down to business business on on Tower Talk Talk Business Business Radio Radio, on on the the voice of Nassau Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Hello and welcome to Tower Talk Business Radio, powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation. My name is Ray Schwetz, AVP of Business Banking at Jovia Financial Credit Union, along with Denisha Boston-Hill, CEO, Keeper of Their Brand, Marketing and Digital Agency. We're focused on being the premier resource for business and entrepreneurship. We bring you weekly business advice tips, tools, and services that help you grow your business. Plus, we interview some of the amazing leaders in business. That's right. Yes. (laughs) We have uh, two very inspiring leaders uh, in our community. Our guest, Tawny Engel, she's the Associate Executive Director of the Long Island Crisis Center and Pride for Youth, and Maria DeMauro, and she is the Community Mobilization Coordinator. Thank you very much for joining us today, Maria and Tawny. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you. We want to hear more about your organization. I was blessed to meet Fran Carlinger years ago and Linda Leonard, both amazing people like yourselves. Just like anytime you meet an organization, a nonprofit that does amazing work, you know, you you learn about their mission and you fall in love with them and you want to work with them. And uh, that's how, you know, we view Long Island Crisis Center and Pride for Youth. So for the uninitiated, why don't you share with us a little bit about yourselves? Um, I guess I'll go first. I, you know, it's funny you say that because I feel like that's exactly how I got involved with Long Island Crisis Center and PFYs because, I mean, I started out as an intern, but when I, when I, heard about their mission and you know the work that they do I had the same reaction I fell in love with it and decided I really wanted to be a part of it and then I got lucky and and a a job opening came up (laughs) and so I've actually been with the organization since 2008 um, kind of worked my way up to this position I'm in now as associate executive director and And Maria? Maria I've been involved with PFY since 2015. I just recently graduated college and I came home to Long Island and I'd recently come out of the closet. And so I Googled LGBTQ Long Island and PFY was the first thing that came up. But at the time it was called Pride for Youth. And so I uh, I interviewed to volunteer and I ended up volunteering for quite a few years. It was just You walk into this space and, you know, if you've ever seen it, it's there are rainbows everywhere. The staff are so warm and friendly. There's really nothing like it, but there was just such an energy about the space that made me feel like I never wanted to leave. This was just such a special organization. And I volunteered for the youth program called Coffee House. And then a few years later, I ended up getting hired to run Coffee House in a very full circle moment. And I've been there ever since. And now I'm the community mobilization coordinator. I'm just, I always joke, I'm never going to leave because I I really believe in the mission of PFY. I really, I've seen as a volunteer, as an intern, and as a staff member, the amazing work that PFY does. It's really such a unique, special place. That's fantastic. And there's a lot of recognition going on, especially during the month of June, where we're acknowledging pride. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the services that you provide for the Crisis Center and also PFY? So we have kind of two sides of our organization, um, Long Island Crisis Center and uh, Pride for You, or PFY is what we call it now. Long Island Crisis Center has been around since 1971, and they're a crisis intervention hotline service 24-7. All the services are, are free and confidential, and it's basically a hotline service for anyone who's in crisis. One of the taglines we have is any problem, anyone, anytime. It's literally any anyone of any age or background on long, living on Long Island who's in crisis, in need, and just needs to talk to someone. They can call our hotline number. It's 516-679-1111 and speak to a trained uh, counselor to kind of help them through any any crisis that, that may be going on and also to get resources that are available to them on Long Island for ongoing help. And essentially how PFY got started out of that is in the early 90s, they were getting a lot of calls on the hotline from folks who were looking for services like counseling, supportive groups, spaces to go to for LGBTQ individuals. And there was nothing like that that existed at that time, definitely not on Long Island. And so what Long Island Crisis Center did is they saw this need in the community community because they were getting so many calls of this nature and they decided, hey, 
since there is no service like this, let's start something. And they, they were able to secure a small foundation grant. And then they started what Maria was referring to before as our coffee house program. That's our longest running program. It started in 1993. We did some counseling back then as well. Very, very small, you know, center. And essentially, we have grown exponentially ever since. <laughs> so being in 1993, we're almost 30 years later, and we're still expanding all the time. And I should mention that back then things were the climate looked very different. You know, we weren't talking about LGBTQ identities as much in the mainstream. We actually lost, Long Island Crisis Center actually lost a lot of funding because they started working with the LGBTQ community specifically. They lost Nassau County funding. A lot of private donors wanted to back out because they weren't interested in in, in you know, being connected with the agency anymore. Uh, we were actually the first, PFY was the first um, organization of our kind in a suburban setting in all of the United States. So we're very proud of that. <laughs> and I don't, you know, Maria, if you want to go on to, you know, kind of talk about the services that PFY um, offers now, because like I said, we have grown significantly from those days of just coffee house and counseling. <laughs> Right. Like, as Tawny said, it we kind of started almost as a preventative uh, prevention service in that if you were a young LGBTQ person and you wanted to meet people like you, you had to haul all the way out to New York City and go to a gay bar or gay club. And while that could be a really fun time, that's not a really safe space for, let's say, a 13 or 14 year old who just wants to figure out who they are. So right. the coffee out space almost imitated like a club-like atmosphere, but it was substance-free, supervised by adults with counselors running the program. And like Tawny said, Coffee House was sort of the main program for a really long time. And then we've expanded since then. We have various different groups for various different identities. I think one of the big misconceptions about PFY, understandably, because it was formerly called Pride for Youth, is that it's only a youth center. And that's not true anymore. And that's why we go with the name PFY instead. We have groups for people up to age 45. We have groups for LGBTQ adults. We have groups for um, LGBTQ men. We have programs for people living with HIV. We have groups for um, people of color, uh, Latino men. Uh, we have groups for trans people. We have a group just for trans women. So we have various different groups and programs. Um, the tagline, uh, you can see it right under the PFY logo. It says creating success through pride. And I think it's something we really embody. I think another misconception that comes up about the LGBTQ community in general is that the community needs special treatment or to be put on a pedestal. All the community needs is a space to be themselves. And that's what we provide. I, I watch the shyest kids who will come in and their, their parents will call and be like, listen, he's really shy and really awkward. OK, and he'll have his hood up and he'll have his eyes on the ground and he'll walk into our group and not talk to anybody. And I guarantee you, within three months, that kid is the brightest light in the room just because he had space to be himself. That is all the LGBTQ community needs, and that is what PFY represents. So those programs have been really important for that. But then we've also expanded to counseling services, mental health counseling, counseling for people in the trans and non-binary community who need help accessing trans-affirming services like HRT or surgeries and need resources uh, with them and their family to navigate that very complicated process. We also do a lot of HIV prevention work. We do HIV testing, syphilis testing, linkages to PrEP and PEP, um, education surrounding HIV and PrEP and PEP and all of those things. Um, sexual health. We're a very sex positive space with the idea of giving people the information and education they need to make the best decisions for their life and their bodies. Uh, we do a lot of education. We go into schools and organizations all across Long Island and Queens and train staff and talk to students in high schools, colleges, and even elementary schools about the LGBTQ community because knowledge is power and having that information is so important. Um, we also hold huge events as well, um, which is a very exciting part of my job. Um, we just held the biggest event of our agency of the year. It is our Pride event. It's called Pride After Dark. 
And this was our first time holding this huge event in person in two years. And let me tell you, walking into that space, it was like euphoria. It was, everybody was thrilled. Everybody was so happy to be connecting again after lockdown for a couple of years. Right. And Pride After Dark, we have drag celebrities. We have lip sync contests, dancing. It's like a party club like atmosphere. But most importantly, it's safe. It's substance free. It's a good place where you can bring, um, you know, youth who, you know, will be connecting with their community, therefore decreasing their social isolation, increasing their mental health. Um, but they're not running into risky behaviors like um, substance abuse or unprotected sex or, or things like that. And that's a big part of what we do as well. We also have HIV testing throughout that whole event totally for free. Um, so we do big events like Pride After Dark. We also do a, a fully Spanish speaking um, beauty contest that's coming up in a couple of months called oh, Miss wow. Diva. Yeah, we do drag bingo events. Um, speaking of drag bingo, we just had our PFY fundraiser, which was a, a drag bingo event. So, so as you can see, we started as just a Friday night fun place for LGBTQ youth to hang out into a very widespread organization who uh, does quite a lot of different services. You are listening to Tower Talk Business Radio on the voice of Nash Community College 90.3 WHPC. I'm Ray Schwetz, along with Denisha Boston Hill, and our guests today are Tani Engel and Maria DeMauro from the Long Island Crisis Center and PFY. All those services are amazing, and the events, I can tell you that I've experienced an event in the past. I'm trying to think of what the title of the event was, but it was a wonderful event with the Crescent Beach Club where Heather Matarazaro, I'm mispronouncing her name, the actress Heather Matazaro. Am I pronouncing it I'm right? Not, I'm not going to do any better. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, it was a great event. Uh, lots of smiling, lots of dancing, lots of uh, connecting. It was one of the happiest events I've ever been to. You mentioned, you know, you kind of started in 1993, and this was very new, and people weren't thinking this way. People weren't being inclusive. How did you get the community to kind of warm up and embrace you so that these services that are vital could be provided? I mean, I think it's just been a matter of, time and and patience and i mean <laughs> and persistence exactly and you, you know as, as maria said we do a lot of education in the community not only for students like in school settings we you know we'll go into health classes and talk about sexual orientation and gender identity and and try to educate you know young people but the other thing that we do a lot of is professional development training so we do a lot of work where we not only go into school settings and talk to school faculty and supportive staff but we also go into hospitals settings and other, you know, agencies, other community-based organizations and talk to social workers and, you know, anybody in the community who is work who might encounter working with the LGBT community in some capacity and, and wants to learn, you know, and, and we, we, um, you know, just talk about best practices of how to work with the community. And so that's kind of our way of educating and, and just, you know, helping people to understand what, what, how to, how to best work with the community. And I, you know, and I think, of course, just politically things things have changed over over time it's a slow go you know i can tell you from experience having worked with in the organization and worked so closely with the community especially with young people when marriage equality passed a few years back i mean that was that was huge it was it was very meaningful that you know young people 14 15 16 years old they're not necessarily thinking about getting married but just what that message sent to young people saying that hey, now you have the right to do something that the rest of the world has the right to do. And, and suddenly now, you know, you are more equal. And so seeing these changes that, that happen. So, but like you said, persistence on our part too, like we don't back down. <laughs> and that's you know, great. We know, yeah, we know what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes working at PFY, we're, we do feel like we're in a little bit of a bubble because, you know, like Maria said, it is such a, a safe and warm and welcoming environment. And then we go out into the world and we go, oh, right. We're reminded that we still have a lot of work to do. You did face a lot of challenges during the pandemic. It's pretty amazing how you responded outside of the box thinking and innovation and that persistence again. So can you talk to us a little bit about how your organization pivoted to 
you know, continue the services and um, and actually, you know, even expand the services that you provide. From from the start of the pandemic back in March um, 2020, when when you know COVID first hit Long Island, we. We were, we were very prepared. We knew it was coming and really only shut down our services for two days. A lot of organizations were having to close their doors altogether for, for weeks, months. What we did is basically we prepared ourselves to switch over to virtual platforms for all of our, you know, our groups, our um, social programming, our counseling services. And the good thing about working with young people, Maria said, of course, you know, we do offer programs for adults as well, but, but our young people, especially were very, very, they're, they're very tech savvy. So it was super easy just to be like, Hey, we're all going to meet via zoom or what, you know, whatever platforms we were using in the beginning. And it was, it was very easy to do. People were very open to to doing it that way. It actually sort of opened our eyes to the fact that we, we were engaging a lot of new clients who um, weren't able to get to us otherwise. Like they couldn't actually get to our physical space when we were meeting in person prior to the pandemic because for geographical reasons, you know, maybe they live too far out east or they, uh, you know, on Long Island or they um, weren't out to their families and they weren't comfortable asking to be dropped off at a youth center that was LGBT specific. So a lot of people were able to actually access our programs virtually that couldn't get to us before. And we realized, oh, wow, you know, this is this is great. So that was kind of one of the silver linings to to uh, what we learned. We also even expanded some of our services. Like, for example, we found that a lot of our clients were um, finding themselves in in homeless situations during the pandemic, especially in the early days. They were, you know, being kicked out of their homes or, you know, weren't comfortable being in lockdown um, in their, their home environments. So we actually started an emergency COVID uh, housing program where we were able to give people gift cards for uh, hotels and, you know, that kind of thing. And as, as well as um, wow. uh, gift cards for grocery stores and restaurants and stuff so they could, you know, get food. So, yeah, so that was a new program that we started with some emergency funding, as well as in-home HIV testing. Maria talked about, you know, we have a really large HIV testing program. You know, in the early days of the lockdown, we weren't able to meet at all. We weren't able to actually open our doors and say, hey, come in and get an HIV test. But we know how important that service is, and we didn't want to lose folks. We started sending HIV testing home kits that are available. We would actually deliver them to people's homes. And then we would offer the service of sitting virtually while someone took their test. And then if they have a reactive result, we could still do the counseling process and get them connected to treatment. Those were some some services that we just said, we've got to do this. We've got to figure out ways to adapt to the unfortunate circumstances, unprecedented circumstances that we'd never faced before. And, and we kind of just did it. You definitely, like I said, you thought outside the box, you were innovative, you jumped in, you rolled up your sleeves and you made it happen. Yeah. Well, you don't, you don't want clients to feel abandoned, especially during a time like that. So that was our main objective is, is how do we keep our clients engaged and, and connected um, not only not only to services, but socially, so that they know that they're still supported and, and that their peers are still you know out there. And so that was what our goal was. You have to meet them where they're at, right? And where the LGBTQ community was at during lockdown was oftentimes hiding who they were in their, their confines of their bedroom or whatever private space they had in their home. For a lot of people, PFY, the physical building, was the only place they could be who they were um, and express themselves the way they want to. And in lockdown, they were all felt kind of trapped um, in, a, in a place where they couldn't be affirmed and supported. So where they were at, were finding safe havens online anyway, um, whether they were using social media or discord and they were forming groups online, um, having their social interactions through voice chats with their friends or playing video games together. And we were smart about that and we took that and we were able to meet them right where they were at and coming to a weekly group over Zoom um, where we were playing games together, where we were having rich discussions, where we were 
holding events. We found that a lot of people loved watching live streams. That became really popular through the pandemic. So we made one of our events a huge live stream. So it was a lot of just meeting the community where they were at at that time instead of backing away and saying, this is too different. We're way over our head. Um, this isn't going to work. We, we molded and changed with what the community was already doing anyway. Um, so that way we could do what we've always done, which is supporting the community and making sure whatever they're doing it, whatever they're doing, they're doing in a safe way. There's some amazing campaigns that were a result directly of your work. And I'd like you to talk a little bit about that because I think that that's hugely important. Maria, I think you're the best person to speak to that since you're the community mobilization coordinator. <laughs> a lot of most of our campaigns come out of our community mobilization work. Right. I mean, social media marketing is so incredibly powerful, especially right now. And one of the campaigns that we uh, helped to pioneer was the U equals U campaign. Um, U equals U stands for undetectable equals untransmittable, which was incredible news for the whole community. I'm essentially saying that if you um, are HIV, uh, you have HIV and your viral load is at an undetectable level, it is a very, 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 very low chance that you can transmit the virus. Now, this can do wonders for stigma um, for people who have, you know, have HIV and they've been seen or see themselves as dirty or you can't be with somebody like that or you can't you know have a sex life or anything like that this is incredible news that you just need to take your your medicine keep up with getting tested and you can live freely um so we a lot of people at the time a lot of organizations at the time didn't want to back up that message and pfy was one of the first ones to back up that message and our u equals u campaign has been going for quite a few years now we have video ads you'll see on tv on youtube um, you'll see images as well um, so u equals u is a pretty big campaign as well Another campaign that we were pioneering was we saw an increase in HIV transmissions throughout the pandemic. And PFY, I think, was the only organization that I know of who hopped on that and threw a campaign out there reminding the community that, yes, it's important to get tested for COVID because that's what the language was at that time is get tested for COVID, get tested for COVID. Right. But you also need to get tested for um, STIs and HIV, too. Um, and that's what we think was happening. People were forgetting to get tested for HIV and STIs um, and were only getting tested for COVID because that's what the focus was. Again, this is life changing for folks. So kudos to you for, for doing that work. You also collaborate with other nonprofits as well, correct? Talk a little bit about that, some of the work that you're doing there. We do a lot of collaborating. I mean, just, you know, in general, because we do uh, case management as part of our counseling program. So, you know, we have to work with other organizations because, of course, our services are not the end all be all. You know, we, we recognize that that folks do need to, you know, for example, if someone comes up reactive for HIV or, or any other STI, you know, we're, we have to connect them, you know, to treatment. So we work with medical providers in, in the area. We work with Northwell Health. We work with uh, Stony Brook University and, you know, a lot of other medical institutions. And in addition to that, on our community mobilization grant, we also work with Hofstra University. We work with Sun River Healthcare, you know, just just providing what what something that Hofstra helps us do actually is, we, you know, these campaigns that you were talking about. We want to also ensure that they are effective, you know, that people are actually understanding the messages that we're putting out there. So, for example, Hofstra actually helps us with the empirical sort of background on that, where they actually do surveys in the community and, and they want to make sure, for example, like with U equals U. Do people understand what that messaging means? They help us with the sort of the research behind all of that. You are listening to Tower Talk Business Radio. Our guest today is Twani Engel and Maria DeMauro from the Long Island Crisis Center and Pride for Youth. My name is Denisha Boston Hill, along with Ray Schwetz on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. You know, looking back, like what are some of the, the biggest things that you feel like, you know what, I'm so happy. I'm so proud. We accomplished this. What are the biggest accomplishments when you look back? It's a big one. Um, I, you know, honestly, I, it's just, it's interesting to me because, you know, of course, like, you know, just, just starting programs that I didn't even necessarily dream of when I first started in 2008, when I was first working for the organization, I can, I can literally say from, from data reports that we had at that time, 2% of our population identified as transgender at that time openly. And we, we had 
very, very limited knowledge, you know, and that's that's only just 14 years ago. Of course, we were very supportive of the community, but we didn't know as much as we know now. Over the years, the expansion of that again you know it's not like people it's not like more people identify as transgender it's just that more people are out about it more people are really talking about it openly more in in kind of mainstream settings and then they know that they can come to our space and and be themselves and have this this environment where where there is no stigma around that so and it's safe right it's a safe space Exactly. And so, you know, the idea is we're providing this space where people can talk about their identities and talk about who they are. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. And and so to me, when I just sort of look back over time, that's just an example. You know, that's just sort of a um, how, how things have kind of evolved. The other thing I would say is a, a, a big thing that I'm very proud of myself is, is we have a, a group called Pride for Parents. And that was something that I, you know, I think the organization had been trying to get started for a long time, but it just wasn't really working. We didn't have a lot of buy-in. And uh, what we do know is that parental support, family support is the number one factor that correlates to um, LGBTQ youth lowering maladaptive risk behaviors such as, you know, depression or suicidal ideation or, um, you know, substance abuse or, you know, those kinds of things. So, so you know, we really understand the importance of family support. We know it's not always possible, you know, we recognize that, that there are sometimes cultural barriers or, you know, things that, that go on that we're not going to, we're not going to be able to change. And, and in those cases, you know, safety is, is the number one factor. But when we can get families involved, we, we really try and we started this group back in, I think, 2015, 14. Uh, I, I was the first one to run it. And we were, it was, it was great. I mean, we've been running it ever since. It's a very successful group. And, and we do have a lot of folks who come in and, you know, absolutely, they'll tell us, you know, my child literally came out to me this morning um, as transgender, and I have absolutely no idea what that means. I don't know, you know, I don't even know where to begin. And the idea is that we're really giving them a space to ask questions, you know, ask anything and everything. We're not going to be offended. Um, this is where you need to come and, and learn how to best support your child. And when I say child, I mean, it doesn't have to be a young person. We have we have parents of adults, you know, who are trying are struggling and trying to understand how to best support their loved ones. So. So, yeah, so that's a, that to me is really important that we have, you know, families and parents that are more engaged and that we're giving them a space where, you know, we're not judging them. For, for not understanding their child's identity or anything like that. It's it's really yes. just... Yeah, as a parent, I think that that is uh, of major importance and, and a major <laughs> accomplishment. We're going to have to wrap up, but before we go, I want to make sure that we get that hotline. What's the best way to contact you? Yeah, so to call the uh, Long Island Crisis Center hotline 24-7, the number is 516-679-1111. And uh, to reach PFY, uh, you can call 516-679-9111. I'd like to leave you with DB's philosophy. The greatest gift that you can give to others is the gift of unconditional love and acceptance. Brian Tracy. We're very happy that Tawny Angle and Maria DeMara were able to join us today. We want to thank you for being with us. My name is Ray Schwetz, along with Denisha Boston-Hill, your co-host and producers. This is an NCC Foundation production. Visit nccradio.org for more information. We're available on Odyssey, TuneIn, iHeartRadio, and a podcast onto iTunes. Android Podcast and Speaker. This has been Tower Talk Business Radio, powered by the Nassau Community College Foundation on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC.